tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. She was sensuous, charismatic, and talented. One of the bright lights of Seattle's rock music scene. Everyone said Mia Zapata was destined for greatness. Then in July 1993, Mia took a lonely stroll through the dark streets of Seattle and crossed paths with a vicious, unknown killer. Tonight, we're in Seattle, Washington, to investigate the tragic case of this ill-fated young singer. Join me for a dramatic profile of life and death of rock star Mia Zapata, as well as these intriguing mysteries. Thomas David Dixon is a very definition of career criminal. When he's not in prison, he's doing what he does best, robbing banks and brazenly taunting the authorities. Michelle Arkin was just a teenager when a late night confrontation confirmed what she had long suspected. Her mother and father were not her biological parents. Now Michelle needs your help to find the family she never knew. Meet Philip Polly. If you think he looks like an average eight year old, think again. Philip's favorite subjects are geometry and cellular biology. He prefers museums and archeological digs to playgrounds and ball fields. Philip, you see, is a genius whose extraordinary abilities make for a fascinating mystery of the mind. Stay with us for these fascinating stories and our special report on Mia Zapata. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Sheriff's deputy in Florence County, South Carolina, it was a routine call until he uncovered the getaway car from a recent string of bank robberies. Polaroids left in the car showed off a formidable arsenal. A rambling message filled seven pages of a small notebook. It was signed, Tom Dixon. I know the feds are closing in on me, but they need an informant. So need to really watch who I trust. I will not go back to prison under no conditions ever for any length of time. It is hardly surprising that Thomas Dixon vowed never to be taken alive. During the last 22 years, he had been out of prison a scant 18 months. When he wasn't doing hard time, Dixon was robbing banks. The FBI pegged him for at least 12, and there were probably more. In 1984, after a 10-year stretch in prison, Dixon and a series of accomplices terrorized banks across North Carolina. Dixon's partners may have changed, but his M.O. never varied. A Dixon was what we would call a takeover robber. And law enforcement jargon means yeah. that they control everything inside the bank, which means when he came into a bank, usually he or his partner would hold somebody uh, at bay with a weapon, uh, make announcements. This is a robbery. Y'all put your hands where I can see them. This is a hold up. Just stay cool. Move it. Nobody's going to get hurt in the back. Move it along. Move it. You two in the office. Out here. Now. Come on, in the back. Move. In the back. Move. Come on, move. All right, move now it. hand it down. Move it. You sit in that chair, lady, right move there. It. Mister, you just to take a seat right here and put your hands where I can see you. I got the keys. Get up. Get up. Kick the keys to where I can see them. Do it now. Come on, move it. Just keep moving. Open Move it. it. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. The money. Let's get the money. After a string of seven robberies, Dixon went underground. He holed up with a girlfriend in a remote cabin in North Carolina. 
Federal agents got wind of the hideout and moved in. But they weren't taking any chances with Thomas Dixon. We were able to gather enough information about Dixon to know that uh, he had certain patterns that, uh, that might play in, in our favor in trying to make an apprehension. But we knew that he was a jogger. Uh, Dixon has always been uh, in excellent shape, takes good care of himself. Freeze! Dixon, you're under arrest! On the ground, on the ground! It's it's on your back. What are you guys doing? Let me go! When the SWAT team went in to make the search of the cabin, in addition to his female companion, there were uh, seven long-barreled guns, uh, seven uh, handguns of various size and caliber, uh, 25 sticks of dynamite. And uh, we were absolutely shocked at the, uh, the amount of uh, weaponry he had inside the apartment. What is this? Huh? Got a weapon. Thomas Dixon was on his way to another decade behind bars. When Dixon was paroled around Christmas of 1994, he picked up right where he had left off. But now, Dixon always worked alone. Morning. I'll be right with you. That's all right. This is a holdup. I got a police scanner, so don't do anything funny. Just be cool and put the money in the bag. He doesn't come in as a uh, flashy guy. He comes in um, prepared. He's methodical. He thinks about things before he does them. During the summer of 1995, Dixon showed up in one bank surveillance tape after another. Five robberies in a seven-week period. Have you FBI ever heard of Thomas Dixon? man is one badass bank robber. And tomorrow he's going to rob a bank in North Carolina. During the summer robbery spree, Dixon began to taunt the FBI with advance notice of his bank jobs. In one call, Dixon targeted a bank in Matthews, North Carolina. Instead, he turned up in Columbia, South Carolina, 80 miles away. Just put it in the bag. Who's that in the back? That's the manager. You be cool. Dixon's last known heist was September 11th, 1995. You all have a nice day. You can turn on that alarm now if you like. Excuse me. FBI agents see Dixon's flippant self-confidence as a mask for an unstable personality coming apart at the seams. Investigators now believe that Dixon deliberately left the photos, notebook, and getaway car for them to find. Three weeks after Dixon's last robbery, they got the message. A deliberate taunt from a criminal ego running wild. Now, I need a really good score so I can go underground for a few months, get myself back together. I got myself a bulletproof vest. So maybe it'll save my ass long enough to drop a couple of them before I die. P.S. You keep looking and I'll keep working. We'll meet up someday and we'll see if it's you or is it me. I don't think there's any question that Dixon has become a, a walking time bomb. Dixon was alerting us to the fact that, that he is uh, heavily armed and he has every intention of using those arms in a confrontation with law enforcement. Next, when a young woman is found dead floating in the Chesapeake Bay, two old boyfriends emerge as suspects. Maryland's Natural Resource Police routinely monitor the state's coastal areas, tracking down poachers and enforcing game regulations. But on the 30th of August, 1993, 
an NRP patrol pulled the body of an attractive brunette from the Chesapeake Bay. Steve, do you have an idea on the burner to find her? No. The woman was identified as Nancy Manny, one of the few female members of the Seafarers International Union. Nancy had made a career sailing the world as a ship steward. But now, at the age of 33, Nancy was dead, drowned and possibly murdered. Who could have killed Nancy Manny? The investigation quickly narrowed in on an ex-boyfriend named Billy Mesmer, a self-styled poet whose dark rhymes hinted at a dangerous obsession. It looked like a rock-solid theory until rumors seemed to implicate another boyfriend and some of his associates in the Seafarers Union. And overshadowing all was a second murder victim, a young woman identical to Nancy in almost every way. When was the last time you saw Nancy? Wednesday. Billy Mesmer was questioned two days after Nancy's body was found. Poems Billy had written to Nancy while they were lovers aroused suspicion. Perhaps most notable were these lines. Excited breath escapes his lips while he waits without the light. No one will ever hear your screams as a predator begins to bite. The poem was signed, Sweet Dreams, Billy. The title, Night Stalker. I've had experts look at it, trying to analyze it, and they have concurred that, you know, he did have an obsession with Nancy at this time. Yeah, I can understand where they would come up with the word uh, obsessive. Uh, Nancy was the love of my life. Uh, I'm a poet. I wrote her poetry constantly, which is a very obsessive things full of feelings and emotion. During the 17 months of their relationship, Billy had written Nancy more than 200 poems. Many were sent to her at seaports around the world. Nancy had sailed to Brazil, Greece, Iceland, and often worked the giant freighters that ferried natural gas from Indonesia to Japan. She often said she liked to play with the boys' toys. She liked to drive the forklifts and do that kind of work. She was very feminine. She was very attractive and fun. She, you know, had a lot of boyfriends, but she hadn't really found a person that she was destined to spend the rest of her life with. She left you for someone else. I don't understand why you keep accusing me of things. I really felt that the investigation was going in the wrong direction. Obviously, there were uh, crawling all over me with a microscope, and I was terribly frustrated that the person who actually did this was going to get away. She came by and... Uh, Billy Mesmer had a plausible alibi. He also had a suggestion for the police. Take a look at certain members of the Seafarers International Union. At the time of her death, Nancy had been studying at this union-run training center the Harry Lundeberg School of Seamanship in Piney Point, Maryland. She was dating a union member who was connected to the school. Billy says that Nancy came to his apartment a few days before her death. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Nancy, come on in. Hi, Billy. Hey, are you OK? Nancy had a very, very bad falling out with her boyfriend. He had told her that if she didn't do things as he wanted, he would make things very difficult for her within the union. She simply said, if you do this, then I will expose you for what you are. According to Billy Mesmer, the secret Nancy threatened to reveal may have had something to do with illegal drugs. It's been rumored for years that certain members of the union and of the school down at Piney Point have been involved in international drug trafficking. Not only that, but possible disappearances within the union and within the local community. I've had several people come clandestinely to me to report that they suspected uh, illegal activity at the school was the cause of Nancy's death. Again, it's been unsubstantiated, um, and they they fear for their lives or their jobs, which is why they don't want to be known. 
After her death, I had received some telephone calls from friends of hers that were also union members who had told us that they felt that her death was not accidental and that it was possibly linked with the union and with the school. For Nancy's sister, Linda, the unsettling rumor seemed even more credible when she received Nancy's personal effects from the school. In going through Nancy's things, I had noticed that a lot of things were missing, particularly pictures of her union boyfriend and his family. And I know that she wouldn't have thrown them away. She would have kept those. There was more. Nancy's camera was empty and its internal mechanism jammed, as though someone had forcibly ripped out a roll of film. I feel that someone had tampered with her camera, and so that led me to be more suspicious that someone in the school had obviously entered her room. There are also suspicions about Nancy's final work assignment. Before entering the school, Nancy sailed on the SS Mayaquez, a ship which employed many union members. She died in August. In June, I got this letter from her when she was working on the SS Mayaquez. One paragraph says, things are so bad on this ship that I'm getting death threats now. And I let that go, and I regret it every day that I didn't demand to know who exactly said that and why and what exactly was said. One more disturbing question hangs over this case. Is there a link between Nancy's death and the 1988 murder of a young woman named Elizabeth Greenberg? Elizabeth and Nancy had the same hair color, same eye color, were nearly identical in height and weight. Like Nancy, Elizabeth was a ship steward, a member of the Seafarers Union. Elizabeth worked the same Indonesia to Japan trade route that Nancy sailed a few years later. Both women were attending the Union's training school when they died. Although Elizabeth was killed by a blow to the head, she too was found floating in the Chesapeake Bay. It's eerie when you look at both cases, the similarities in their life and their lifestyles. Uh, as yet, we haven't found a common denominator between the two as far as boyfriends or, or close friends. But uh, somewhere along the line, there's got to be a thread. I fear that Nancy's death is going to be simply written off as unsolved. And even though everyone in the county knows that something wrong, unlawful, cloak and dagger is going on, they're terrified to talk about it. With the information that has been given to me on an anonymous basis over the past two years since Nancy's death, I'm beginning to fear for my own life. It's said that the human brain is one of the last great frontiers. Despite years of research, we have only a few hints about why some people become Einsteins and others Forrest Gump. The source of genius remains secret, a true unsolved mystery. <laughs> this is Philip Pauly of Denver, Colorado. He may look like an average eight-year-old, but Philip is quite literally one in 10 million. Philip's abilities are practically immeasurable. Philip is a genius. In fact, Philip is so smart that he is too smart for school. If you need any help, let me know, okay? Thanks. You're welcome. These days, his mother teaches him at home because even programs for gifted students couldn't keep up with Philip's insatiable demand for knowledge. 
Well, I'm studying algebra and geometry and the Middle Ages and cellular biology. And in the Middle Ages, I'm working on the, the castle defenses. How do I explain Phil's gifts? That, to me, is a mystery, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's, it's not that Philip, Philip's dad or I are dumb, but we do, we, neither of us have the IQs to match Phil. So, it, it, to me, it, it was a gift to have a son like Philip. From the very beginning, it was clear that Philip was brighter and more alert than most babies. At six months, he started to talk and had enough manual dexterity to remove the bolts from his crib. At nine months, Philip displayed a highly mature emotional sensibility. During an experiment, he was asked to spank a doll three times to show he understood counting. Philip refused to strike the doll. Finally, when the examiner thought he couldn't understand what was going on, he patted the doll three times and then held it and hugged it and protected it from the examiner and tries, tried to soothe the doll's feelings. This is not something his mother taught him to do because any mother would have a hard time trying to teach something like that to a nine-month-old. At 18 months, Philip could already read. For his second birthday, he asked for a violin. Within days, he was playing simple tunes he had composed himself. Philip was light years ahead of his peers. One particular time we took him to, to church and we put him in and at the two-year-old level and we, put, we picked him up and after school, the first thing he says to me is, Mom, they don't talk. <laughs> and he was two and he didn't realize that other kids his own age weren't doing those kind of, same kind of skills. At three, Philip was studying astronomy. He had little use for Mickey Mouse or Winnie the Pooh. His hero was astronaut Buzz Aldrin. Hey, Mom, let's go over here. There's more stuff. Okay. By the time Philip was four, the Denver Museum of Natural History was his favorite playground. One day, he even spotted a mistake in a museum mural that had gone unnoticed by the curators for 30 years. What's the matter, huh? The helmets are wrong. What's wrong with them? Those are French helmets, and these are conquistadors. How do you know that? Incredibly, Philip had been able to detect the subtle differences between a medieval French helmet and that of a Spanish conquistador. On another visit to the museum in that same year, Philip asked the curator why a dinosaur skeleton was missing several vertebra in its tail section. Nice and the curator explained there. at the time that the dinosaur was too large for the area that they had, had designated for it. So, but with the new exhibit, they were going to get it correct and not to worry about it. But he was flabbergasted. He says, it's, you're the only person that's noticed. Research indicates that along with heightened mental abilities, child geniuses often show a hypersensitivity to humanitarian issues. He carries the weight of the world on him. He's worried about the economy within the United States and the, and the government structure, as well as what's going on around the world and how it affects, how what we do affects other nations. There's times that he gets so consumed with these worries that he'll stop eating, he, he bites his nails, he loses sleep. I mean, these are things that we have to talk about what he can actually do on a personal level to help mankind. It makes me feel sad that um, America does not value education, and America is becoming more like a Roman Empire than the great nation it was. And here's a few reasons. Because, like, one is that he, that we're doing the gladiators, like in our movies, and we're going to have a worse fate than the Roman Empire. I just know. So where would you expect a child like Philip to play? A baseball diamond? Not on your life. Try an archaeological dig. Okay, there you go. I think Philip working at the site here has fun. Uh, he knows it's important. Uh, he understands uh, uh, the value of what he's doing. It's intellectually stimulating, but he's digging in the dirt. Philip has a lifetime of enthusiasm for each of his favorite subjects. 
So much so that when we asked him what he wants to be when he grows up, he had a tough time picking just one job. A paleontologist, an archaeologist, a conservationist, and hopefully I'll be the commander to the mission to Mars and, if, and the chief curator of the Denver Museum of Natural History. And if, if all of the other jobs fail, I would really want to be a great composer on the line of Baroque, um, Baroque, classical, and romantic eras in the music stage. Or and the list goes on. Art, artifact number 23. But what makes a genius? Is it nature or nurture? Scientists truly don't know. But one of the wilder explanations is that geniuses possess knowledge and skills acquired in other lifetimes. He told me one time that he had heaven had opened and he could he could look down and he had chose me as his mom because I would be the right one for him. It's clear to me that many, many gifted children come in knowing more than it would be explainable by scientific standards. Where they get that knowledge from, I don't know. But I would not discount any possibility, including reincarnation, that there's something evolutionarily different about them, that the brain structure is different, or the function of the brain is different, or that they are visiting us from more evolved cultures. Anything is possible. <laughs> Philip doesn't have much time left for childhood. In two years, he'll be old enough to take the college entrance exams. He plans to enroll at the University of Denver. After that, the sky's the limit. Do I think that Philip's a genius? I think that the definition that society gives the IQ test says yes. I think whether he will be a genius or not will be if he uses and utilizes the, the intellect and the abilities that he has to help mankind. Then I think he would be a genius. So what are we going to go see today? The Hall of Life, the science and sports, and People used to believe genius was the rarest of gifts, okay. but children okay. like Philip can crop up anywhere. The danger is that the talents of these special kids often go unrecognized. Experts tell us that even children with learning disabilities may be hidden geniuses. If your child seems smarter or more talented than average, he or she should be tested. Who knows? You may be nurturing the next Einstein. When we return, an unexpected death splits a young family apart. Perhaps someone watching can bring them together again. Michelle Arkin was 16 when she almost discovered the family secret. Her mother Laverne had to improvise in order to preserve it a while longer. How'd it go? I didn't get the job. The personnel officer said that my birth certificate was phony. Phony? What do you mean? He said that it had been amended. Oh, that's baloney. I don't know what they're talking about. There is nothing wrong with your birth certificate. They just said that my birth certificate wasn't legal, that they had things on there that shouldn't be, and I was very shocked. I mean, as far as I knew, that was my birth certificate. That was what I grew up with that was correct. You get a job at another store, okay? Okay. Cheer up. Laverne Neal had dreaded this moment for years. Michelle was not her biological child. To tell or not to tell? And if you tell, when? Like thousands of couples who adopt, Laverne Neal and her husband Wilburn confronted these difficult questions. There are no right or wrong answers. However, parents who decide against revealing the facts will almost certainly face years of fancy footwork to keep their secret secret. Laverne and Wilbur Neal will always remember the day in September of 1965 when they first set eyes on Michelle. The Neals had been married for four years, 
They were eager to start a family, but had been unsuccessful. Hi, Wilburn. Hey, Raleigh. Nice to see you, Laverne. Come on in. We just got home. Out of the blue, their friends Raleigh and Juanita Gore had offered the Neals a chance to adopt a baby girl. Oh, she's beautiful. The child's mother, a friend of the Gores, was unable to care for the infant herself. She had entrusted Raleigh and Juanita with finding a loving home. She's gorgeous. I loved her. I right off. I didn't hesitate. Didn't have no doubts. We just uh, looked at each other and said, what do we know about raising a baby? And neither one of us did. And so she said, we can learn fast. For Wilburn and Laverne, Michelle was a dream come true. Two weeks sped by. Then Patricia Bonner, Michelle's birth mother, called. She wanted to see her baby. I knew that Pat was Michelle's mother. And if she wanted to keep her, even though it broke my heart, I knew, you know, I'd have no choice but to let her. Please, come on in. Patricia Bonner had been widowed while she was pregnant with Michelle. Take your sisters in the other room. Vince, now. She already had three young children to raise by herself, so she had reluctantly given up Michelle for adoption. Pat, are you sure you want to do that? Well, I just don't know what else to do. It'd, it'd be different if Johnny was still here, but I, I can't afford to put shoes on my three children. I, I can barely feed them. How am I going to keep her? Well, maybe things will get better, and you know. I know you and Wilburn will give her a good home and care for her. Can I just hold her one more time, please? Uh, of course. I knew that lady had to be hurting bad, and I hurt for her because I knew I could, I could feel how, how she was hurting. There's a couple of other things, Pat. We'd like to draw up some papers to make the adoption legal. That'll be no problem. But when the Neals returned two weeks later, Patricia Bonner and her children were gone. Vince, would you go inside and get that bag, please? The apartment was empty. She had moved, and she left no forwarding address. Nobody knew where she went. The absence of formal adoption papers didn't prevent Michelle from enjoying a typical childhood. By the age of five, she had a brother named Stephen, a Neil's biological child. Michelle's background was never discussed. Me and Laverne, we talked about it many a times. Should we go ahead and tell her? We figured Michelle would uh, feel like she was left out. She wouldn't be equal to Stephen if she's not belonged to us. And uh, we just decided that it'd be better to wait till she was older. The family secret was safe for a while. When Michelle began school, the Neals had to submit a birth certificate. With the help of a relative in Kentucky, they obtained this one, listing themselves as Michelle's biological parents. By the time Michelle entered high school, the family secret had started to fray. Michelle began to ask her parents if she had been adopted. The answer was always no. I don't know what he's talking about. There's nothing wrong with your birth certificate. I felt very bad because I never did like to say anything that wasn't true. And here, I was doing just the opposite of what I was teaching my children. And it really bothered it. It hurt me quite a bit. Finally, the burden became too heavy for Michelle's parents. Michelle, come in here, please. Finally, they were ready to talk. We have to talk. I know, I'm late, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. No, it's not about that, Michelle. Uh, sit down, please. She said, I've heard from too many sources that uh, I was adopted. And she said, you got to tell me the truth. And so I told her the truth about it. You see, you are sort of adopted. 
What do you mean, sort of adopted? You remember Raleigh and Juanita? You remember us talking about them? I felt that they had betrayed me only because they've always told me the truth when I've asked it. Mom, is this true? It was always, um, you know, bottom line, this is the way it is. And I just felt that they lied to me. And that's why I was so upset. We didn't want to hurt you. We wanted to do what was right. Oh, so you just let me live my entire life? Uh, Michelle, <laughs> lie. Michelle. Don't touch me. I moved out two weeks later. I got an apartment with my girlfriend, which my girlfriend, they could not stand, so maybe that was a little bit more of my rebelli you know, rebellious uh, act on my part, but uh, I mean, eventually I came around. I came back to mom and dad. Today, Michelle is herself a parent, the mother of a boy and a girl. With her parents' blessing. Michelle has begun to search for her birth mother and the three siblings she has never met. Hi, is there a Patricia Hensley Barr there? Uh, no, how about a Vincent? Can I just hold her one more time, please? Uh, of course. I can understand what she did uh, back then. I would just feel better just knowing where I came from, what my relatives, what, you know, just simple, basic questions that any person would have. In a moment, we'll come back to Seattle to investigate the tragic murder of rock and roll singer Mia Zapata. Since 1991, the hottest spot in rock and roll has been Seattle, Washington. Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and Alice in Chains all came out of the local music scene. Many people thought the next breakthrough band would be The Gits, a punk rock group fronted by Mia Zapata, a charismatic 27-year-old with a tragic destiny. I went through many shows where afterwards people didn't even know I was up on stage because their eyes were so transfixed on Mia. She was someone who had something to say, and uh, she was very, very uh, compassionate and big-hearted person, and she brought that into, into the band. But on July 7th, 1993, the good times were abruptly snuffed out. Around 2 a.m., Mia Zapata left a friend's apartment. An hour later, her body was found two miles away, reportedly laying face up in an almost Christ-like pose. Mia had been beaten and strangled. Mia Zapata's death set shockwaves with the tight-knit music community here in Seattle. Why had this promising and popular young singer been killed? Was it an obsessed fan, a jealous enemy, or a complete stranger? In an eerie coincidence, Mia alluded to her own violent death in one of the last songs she recorded. The haunting lyrics spoke of someone slashing her and hinted that that someone might never be found. You might say Mia Zapata was born to be a star. She grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, the daughter of two television executives. After high school, Mia went on to Antioch College in Ohio. There she met the other three members of the Gits. After five years together, the Gits were attracting interest from major record companies. The first full-scale U.S. tour was in the works, and Mia had a new look. For the little girl from Louisville, it was like a dream come true. I don't think I can ever remember my daughter f looking so satisfied, so content, so uh, at ease with herself. It was all coming together. July 6, 1993. 
The evening began at one of Mia's favorite bars. She met friends there about 10. Mia was in town only briefly. She and the Gits had been on the road for three weeks, and the tour was starting in a matter of days. When Mia left the Comet Tavern, she walked a block east up Pike Street to a local rehearsal studio. She then visited a friend who lived in an apartment three floors up in the same building. About 2 a.m., Mia left, telling her friend she planned to take a cab home. No, I'm gonna just go get a cab. She could have gone anywhere from there. She could have gone out the front entrance, gone down to the corner and hailed a cab as she told her friend she was going to do. Because Mia didn't have a driver's license, she took taxis often and knew many of the local cabbies. You don't need any money. Come on, hop in. This led police and private investigator Lee Heron to one of their first scenarios. Perhaps Mia was murdered by a cab driver. You looking good. <laughs> Mia did not have difficulty expressing her opinion. And sometimes this got her into trouble, and other people liked it. She could have said something to a cab driver that she knew that just made that person angry that night. Significantly, no cabbie reported picking Mia up that night. About the same time, the bars were closing and some of her friends were hailing cabs of their own. No one saw Mia. Scenario number two. She also could have gone in the opposite direction. A friend had asked her to spend the night. She lived about five blocks away. She could have gone down 11th, past a reservoir, and something could have occurred there. In fact, something did occur. Whether it had anything to do with Mia Zapata's death remains a mystery. One of the earliest clues that the police received was from a, a man who had heard a scream, a terrifying scream that night. He was so distraught by it that he actually rushed to see what was going on, but he saw nothing. He lived, however, very close to the reservoir on 11th, where Mia could have gone if she had gone to visit her friend. Scenario number three. Perhaps Mia never left the building where she was last seen. The next day, one of Mia's friends stopped by the studio there and discovered a Gitz demo tape and Mia's personal microphone. This is something that she would have been carrying on her at all times. We don't know whether she left it there after the practice that night or whether she went back to the studio after visiting her friend. Something happened there, and this was simply left. Mia's body was found about two miles from the studio and about three miles from the street where the man heard screams. Despite a thorough search of the area, police found little forensic evidence. This particular investigation has been difficult because we're faced with a situation where we don't know where the actual crime scene was where the murder took place. We obviously only know where we found Mia at, which we don't believe is the same. Had a dream last night that I was dead. Had Without a crime scene or witnesses, leads quickly faded. However, the pain of Mia's death did not. People really were mad. They were angered. They were hurt. They were shocked. They were pissed off. And people wanted justice and people wanted to, to know what had happened. As a police investigation stalled, the remaining Gits decided they needed a private investigator and hired Lee Heron. To raise the necessary funds, they staged benefit concerts. The response was overwhelming. Seattle's best musicians took up the cause, including Nirvana, in one of Kirk Cobain's final performances, and rocker Joan Jett. In their first collaboration, Jet performed Mia's songs with the Gits for a special benefit recording. I want more than anything for them to be able to find out what happened, and so, so there can be some resolution for everybody, because everyone's been working real hard trying to find this person who did this. Who killed Mia Zapata, and why? The police believe it was a random murder. Investigator Lee Heron believes otherwise. 
She is convinced that Mia knew her killer and that the killer may not have acted alone. I think it's entirely likely that a second person was involved in transporting Mia's body, if not in the actual homicide. I base this on the fact that Mia's body was found with her arms out and her legs crossed, as if two people had been carrying her and laid her down. Also, she had been beaten in the course of her attack, but her face was not touched. And I believe that this is more the modus operandi of somebody who knows a person and does not want to attack their face, but attacks their body. With the passion of life I have left, I'm gonna use it to sacrifice myself. Well, I, don't... I just remembered the look on her face of contentment and of uh, accomplishment that last day when we'd finished the tour and uh, how happy she was and how she was smiling. And she smiled at me and with a look of, uh, of real uh, sense of accomplishment. And, uh, like we had a future. The surviving Gits have gone on with their music, forming a new band, the Dancing French Liberals of 48. It is, they believe, what Mia would have wanted, but it will never be the same. Playing music without Mia is very difficult. The chemistry that we shared as a band, having that gone forever, is a hard reality to face every day. I remember her as, as a best friend and, and a sister. One of the warmest, most caring I've ever met in my life. Join me next Friday for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mystery.